All right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me once again to Psalm 2. We're going to look at scene 3, the third scene that's covered in Psalm 2. There's four scenes all together. And the third scene we're going to look at this morning is the exalted son. And we're going to look at verse 7 through 9. Um, I really feel like I need prayer this morning, especially covering a topic of this nature. So let's, let's pray together, shall we? Uh, Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that you've already exalted your son in this place in our worship. And we ask this morning that through your Holy Spirit, your son would be exalted in this place through the proclamation of who he is. Lord, our need is for you. And our need is for you, uh, not as we imagine you to be, but our need is for you just as you are. And we pray this morning, help us by your Holy Spirit. And may the Holy Spirit glorify Jesus Christ in this place. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. In this portion of the psalm, we are introduced to a mystery. Uh, we see a communication going on in the Godhead. Where it's no longer David speaking, but it's the Father who has spoken to the Son. And it is the Son, Jesus, revealing what the Father has said to him. And it's one of those areas of Scripture where we see a communication in the Godhead and in the Trinity where the Father is speaking to the Son. And the Son is revealing what the Father has said to him. Now the Bible is a book of prophecy. And it speaks of historical events as if they already happened. Psalm 2 was written over a thousand years before Christ came. And we already have declared in this passage Christ's resurrection. Only God can do something of that nature. I want you to know the supernatural power of the Bible. Of the book that you have in your hands. And the book that you have come to trust in the God who has written this book. And given this book to you. There is no book like the Bible. There is no book like the Bible that reveals God to us just as he is. And you've heard it said before perhaps that preaches to men just as they are. And only the Bible can do this and only the Bible has this kind of power and revelation in it. There are other books that people have where they claim is a revelation from God. But all those claims are just claims because as we study the very nature of Scripture itself, we see future events being prophesied of as if they had already happened, even though they have not happened yet. Now, for our benefit, the resurrection has occurred. The resurrection has taken place. But it mystifies us and it blows us away to see that every event that has occurred so far that we are aware of in Jesus Christ was prophesied of and predicted of before it ever happened. Now think of, think of it this way. There are many future events predicted in the Bible that haven't happened yet. But God's record so far is pretty good. I say that tongue in cheek. It's excellent. Which guarantees to us and gives us the sure hope that all of the prophecies that were fulfilled in connection with his first coming, it gives us assurance that all the prophecies connected with his second coming will come to pass as well. Amen? All the promises of God in him are yea and amen, under the glory of God by us. And so I want you to know the preciousness of the book you have, that this is only how you are going to know the future and what God's going to do in the future. There's details we don't know. We don't know perhaps where we're going to live 10 years from now or perhaps even a year from now. But the basic declaration of God's plan is set forth before us 
in the Word of God. Now, here we go to this passage, and we'll read verse 7, first of all, and work our way through. It says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. The day that this is spoken of was the day of the Lord's resurrection. What's been spoken of here is the resurrection. But um, what's amazing is, is it's no longer David speaking now. It's Christ speaking through David. And Christ himself is making this declaration in this very passage, the Son of God making this very declaration when he says, I will tell of the decree, the Lord, the Father, has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Isn't it amazing that we have passages in the Bible such as this where we have the Father, God the Father, clearly speaking to God the Son. Powerful, isn't it? We are granted insight and revelation into something that we could not possibly see were it not written in Scripture and recorded in Scripture for us. There's another one in Psalm 110, which says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. You have Yahweh speaking to my Adonai, both being God, by the way. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is declaring something very similar here. You see, it was the resurrection through which God the Father declared who Jesus and God the Son was. His resurrection is the greatest proof and the evidence that the Father owns the testimony of the Son. Because if Jesus was a fake, if Jesus was a phony, he wouldn't have been risen from the dead. Now, we are granted insight in the Bible here, what go, what, something that happened within the Godhead itself. That we have God the Father declaring to the Son, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. But we have the power of God's Holy Spirit raising the Son from the dead. Isn't it amazing to consider this? Now, a quotation here, and this is from a, the Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible. Uh, this verse was quoted by St. Paul, Acts 13, verse 30 and 33. Let's turn there. As fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ. Acts 13, let's go there. And verse 30 and 33. Notice how the Apostle Paul takes Psalm 2 as he's preaching and he confirms to his hearers that what Psalm 2 was referring to was the events that transpired during their time. And notice he says, but God raised him from the dead. That's the central message, really, of, of the gospel, is God raised him from the dead. You know, when God raised Jesus from the dead, what he was saying is, you are my son. This day have I begotten you, right? Eternally back to be with me. In the demonstration of the resurrection, we have a declaration from God himself that, yes, this is my only son. So, but God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. We know that it was a 40-day period where Jesus kept showing up unexpectedly, right? And, 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 and he encouraged him, touch me, handle me, a spirit has not flesh and bone. And he ate with them, he drank with them, clearly showing that a physical resurrection had occurred. And he goes on to say, who are his witnesses unto the people, eyewitnesses now of the resurrection. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, in the Old Testament now, God has fulfilled. 
Isn't that amazing? God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. The time of fulfillment has now arrived. All the promises given to our fathers in the Old Testament through the prophets, he has now fulfilled those promises in that he raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You see the connection there? So, I'm not going to interpret Psalm 2 any differently than how Paul did. Right? Uh, if you want to know the meaning of a scripture, let scripture interpret that scripture for you. Right? The reason why we major on the Word of God is because the Word of God is not only full, the full inspired Word of God, it is also sufficient for all things for us. It is the exact tool that the Holy Spirit uses to regenerate us, to grow us in the faith, to build us up in the faith, to present Christ to us, to get us out of ourselves and into Christ. Only the Word of God has that kind of power. So we major on the Word of God. Outside of Scripture, we do not trust, but we trust what Scripture says. And sometimes we meet believers that want more than Scripture. And when I see believers that way, I say, well, if that's the case, you want too much. Above and beyond what's really needed. Because the Holy Spirit will bear witness to Christ and to the Word of God itself. We need more preaching of the Word of God in these days if we are going to see Christ return to his church in the way that we desire. There is a psalm that says he has exalted his word even above his name, and so we better exalt that word as well. Now going back to the quote here, because there is a false teaching going around, and maybe you've never heard it, and if you haven't, hallelujah. Um, there wasn't any time where Jesus was not the Son. He's been the Son of God from all eternity. There's a teaching I even heard from a very well-known Bible teacher who said that Jesus became the Son of God when he was baptized in the River Jordan. How many of you know that's false? <laughs> it's heresia. Yeah, <laughs> given the Greek word. Um, heresia. Um, definite heresy. And, and the sad thing is, is because we don't major on doctrine, who Jesus is, people are wide open to embrace stuff like that. But there wasn't one single time where Jesus wasn't the Son of God. He's been the Son of God from all eternity. In other words, God has always been a trinity. God has always been triune by very nature. Um, and that's not subject to change, guys. Just want you to know that. He's been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity. And he will yet be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity to eternity. He, he says, I am the Lord and I change not. Now, let's go over to uh, John 17, 5. Because here it says, from eternity, he was the only begotten of the Father. John 17, 5. Let's turn there. John 17, 5. And Jesus praying here is praying to go back to where he was before. He's not praying to go to somewhere where he's never been. And he's addressing God as his father. And he's ready to be offered up as our sacrifice. But Scripture says it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the agonies of the cross. But he says, Jesus said, And now, O oh Father, for some reason it just sounds better in the King James, doesn't it? Doesn't it, TJ? It sounds holier, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Glorify thou me with thine own self. With the glory which I had, past tense, with thee, before the world was. 
Isn't that amazing? The difference, if there was a difference, you see, Jesus has always been the Son from all eternity, but he became flesh. Didn't change who he was, didn't change who he was from all eternity. This has been pre planned from all eternity that the Son of God would come as a man. This was an eternal agreement between God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit that as he's creating man and saying, let us, plural, make man in our own image, in the image of God he made him, he already had in view as he made him in the likeness of the second Adam that was coming, knowing that the fall would happen and knowing and permitting the fall to happen, not that God is the author of sin, but he gave us a free will, and he, and, and he let it happen from the standpoint of he let us do what we wanted to do from our free will standpoint. But think of it this way. Isn't God glorified in his glorious work of redemption? How much does he reveal himself in creation? It's magnificent. And yet we look at his work of redemption and we say, how much more does God reveal himself in this? It's incredible, isn't it? He's glorified in both aspects. So we see that Jesus has always been the Son of God from all eternity because he's addressing the Father as his Father and asking that he would glorify him with his own self, with the glory which he had with him before the world was. Isn't that amazing? Now the Nicene Creed, how many of you went to a church that used to Repeat the Nicene Creed. Anybody? One person? Okay, good. I guess we were the wild bunch that suddenly got grafted in, were we? Uh, no church background there. Uh, the Nicene Creed says this, God of God, light of light. Um, so, this psalm that declares Jesus is God's only begotten, it, it's also quoted in the book of Hebrews, if you turn with me to Hebrews 1 and verse 5. Now, what I want to establish to you from this passage is that Jesus has always been the Son of God. He didn't become the Son of God. He always was the Son of God. And he was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection. But before the resurrection occurred, before eternity, he was and is the Son of God. When he was born on planet earth, he was and is the son of God. When he died on that cross, he was and is the son of God. When he ascended into glory, he was and is the son of God and ever shall be. But uh, just reading out this quote, it says, At the incarnation, the first begotten was brought into the world. He was already the first begotten before he was brought into the world. That's the point. He didn't become the Son of God. He always was the Son of God from all eternity. Now Hebrews 1, verse 5 and 6 says this. Now notice again in this passage we have God the Father speaking to God the Son. Think of it. God in one God in three persons, one in essence. It's the same essence, but three persons. For unto which of the angels said he at any time? Said who? Said who? God, the Father. Amen? Thou art my son. How do we know it's God the Father? Well, this very passage reveals it. Thou art my son. Who is calling him? Thou art my son. It has to be God the Father, right? The Father calling him, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. Now here we have context. You determine the meaning of a passage by its context. In Psalm 2, we know that the passage is being quoted in reference to the resurrection. In Hebrews 1, verse 5 and 6, we now see the passage being quoted in reference to his incarnation. So in other words, when he was incarnated, when he was incarnated into the earth, 
he was just as much the son of God as he ever was. Nothing of that was lost. Nothing of that was gone. This is the mystery. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He truly, fully became a full human being. 100%. But he was still just as much 100% God. Without an ounce of his deity being dropped, an ounce of his deity being relinquished, he was who he was and he forever will be. He, there was a humbling of himself where he um, intentionally limited himself to a human body and submitted to God the Father in all things. But there is a verse that says that the God aspect of who he is was still ever all present. Amen? It's a mystery. But it's a wonderful mystery. To which of the angels said God at any time, You are my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, he quotes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, from verses 1 to 14, when he makes this declaration, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So the revelation here is, this person that's coming is going to be son, capital S. And I will show myself to be his father, and he is my son, not from a beginning standpoint, but from an eternal standpoint. Because the Son of God is the Son of God in the sense that every attribute that is God the Father's, every attribute also belongs to God the Son. There is not one single attribute that God the Son falls behind in that God the Father also has which includes eternality, eternal existence, uncreated. He has life in himself. Take one single attribute away from the Son that belongs to the Father, you no longer have the Son as being God. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, so this is how we know where this was declared, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Think about this. If Jesus is lesser than God the Father, why would he declare to the angels, let all the angels of God worship him? If Jesus isn't God, and if Jesus is something lesser than God, God would never encourage the angels to commit idolatry. Think of that. So the declaration in this passage is who this Jesus really is. Let all the angels of God worship him. You remember perhaps in the book of Revelation when John saw the magnificence of the angel, how he fell at his feet to worship him, and the angel forbade it and said, do not worship me. I'm a servant just like you. Worship God and Him alone. Amen? And if you've got God the Father declaring to all the angels of heaven, worship Him, the Son. Surely that's a huge amount of evidence of who Jesus is. If you're in a group that lessens Jesus, get out of it immediately. <laughs> and if you remain in it, no, for sure, you are worshiping a false Jesus, a Jesus who cannot save your soul, because only the Son of God, being God, can save you and I. If he's lesser than God, then he becomes an insufficient Savior for you and me. I'm such a mess that I need God to save me, not just an angel, hallelujah. And so are you, I believe. Now, let's look at a couple more places here where we have God the Father speaking to God the Son. Let's consider this. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. There's two places here. There's the baptism of Jesus, and there's also the transfiguration of Jesus. We'll look at these two quickly. Um, Because we have neglected doctrine in the church of God, we're wide open for heresy. 
Uh, doctrine is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. People avoid doctrine because they say, oh, it's just going to cause strife and contention. Not if you can point it from the word of God. If it's church doctrine, yeah, it will cause division and dissension. But if it's from the word of God itself, it will create a unity. Amen? This church doctrine we need to avoid, not the doctrine of the Bible. And there can be a difference, my friend, as maybe you found that out over time. Matthew 3, 16, 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Amen. Now this was spoken in the hearing of those who witnessed his baptism. Amazing, huh? That God the Father is bearing witness to God the Son and saying, this is my only beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Plus you have the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove, resting upon the Son, and you have the Father. You have the Father declaring, the Son being baptized, the Spirit resting upon, and in that you have the Godhead, the Trinity. Amazing. Matthew 17, verse 5. Let's go there. Now, you will remember the account that um, Elijah and Moses, or Moses and Elijah, appeared on the Mount Transfiguration. Of course, people ask, will we know each other in heaven? And we joke about having name tags. But I believe that in heaven we will know who each other is. You won't have to ask names up there or get names wrong. How do we know that? Well, there's one evidence that in the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Peter, James, and John had never met Moses and Elijah. Now, we could say it was the beard. There was a dead giveaway with Moses. Now, we could say it was the way Elijah was dressed. I don't know. No, I think it was more than that. I think because they were caught up into a realm that superseded planet Earth. And they saw the kingdom of God come prematurely on that mountain. They saw Jesus radiated. And the cloud came down. And God the Father spoke through the cloud. Peter didn't know what he was talking about. What would you say in that situation? I mean, come, think about it. Especially if you're a talker, right? Lord, shall we build tents? It's good that we're here. Shall we build tents for you? What, one for you, one for Moses and Elijah, and one for us as well? And just as he said that, the cloud came down. Wouldn't you be nervous in a situation like that? I wouldn't know what to say either. And this is where it picks up. He says, oh, Peter, while he was still speaking. He was still speaking. He hadn't finished his sentence. When? Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased listen to him who's speaking in that cloud God who it has to be God the father right how do we know it's God the father this is my beloved son amen <laughs> um, though there's mysteries connected with this, this this aspect shouldn't be rocket science to us if you know if, if I introduce my son as my son, then that kind of makes me the father, right? Oh, by the way, this is my son. I know Gordon and I got a little confused with that one hospital visit, but, you know, uh, that shall remain <laughs> for another time. Um, but the word listen to him is not a suggestion, by the way. Let me give you the Greek word. Um, it's a uh, kuo. And I did pronounce that correctly. I double-checked. <laughs> Sometimes I hear the cor correct pronunciation and my mouth still don't get around it. It's part of being English. Akuo. It means here. It's a verb. It's a present active imperative. You're like, what on earth is that? An imperative is a command. 
It's not a suggestion. It's like, hear him. Listen to what he has to say. Well, let's put it this way. You better listen now to what he has to say. That's an imperative, right? And that's a present imperative. You better listen now to what he has to say. Your soul depends on it. Amen? Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Present active imperative. Now, from a Lauan Nieder put, put this, uh, Lauan Nieder are two uh, Greek scholars. Uh, it means to listen or pay attention to a person with resulting conformity to what is advised or commanded, in this case commanded. So when God the Father is saying, hear him, he's commanding us to, you better listen to the Son. If you don't listen to the Son, then you're not listening to me, would be what he's saying in that, right? In his last days, he has spoken to us, what? By his Son, in his Son, through his Son, and predominantly only through his Son is he speaking to us in these days. You don't need anything else. Amen? Is the Son a sufficient revelation for us of who God is? He better be. If he isn't, we're going to look elsewhere. But the Son of God is enough for you and I to listen, pay attention to a person with resulting conformity to what is advised or commanded to pay attention to and obey. So we listen to him with a desire to obey what he says. Now, they translate this passage, Matthew 17, 5. This is my own dear son with whom I am well pleased. Pay attention to him and obey him. In other words, obey him just as you obey me, right? Because he, you can't have me without him. You're not going to have me without receiving him. And it's through receiving him that you have me. Amen? Jesus himself said that. Jesus said those who honor, honor me honor the Father also. And those who dishonor me dishonor the Father who sent me. You can't have one without the other. Either you embrace Jesus as being God. You can't, you can't embrace the Father as being God and yet reject Jesus as being God because by rejecting who Jesus is, you're rejecting the Father who sent him and you are calling the Father a liar with his testimony. Think about that. Now, going back to the initial quote here, guys, and then we'll hit Romans 1 verse 4 here. Um, so we covered the other aspect in which this is used. It's used in connection with his birth in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, that when he brought his son into the world, uh, God the Father says, let all the angels of God worship him. And what were the angels doing around the birth of Jesus? Weren't they worshiping? When the wise men came and bowed the knee, weren't they worshiping the baby? Think about that. Worshiping a baby. Imagine that. No, they were worshipping the God who was the baby in the baby. <laughs> Think about that. Think about it. Amazing, right? They knew who that baby was. Where is he that is born? The king of the Jews. For we have come to worship him. Those people were Gentiles. Yet they had a revelation of this baby. That it had to come not just from the stars which is wonderful in and of itself, but also from Old Testament Scripture somehow passed on as well. Um, let's, let's continue with this quote here as we begin to wind down. Um, let's see. But it was only at and by his resurrection that his divinity as the only begotten of the Father was manifested and openly attested by God. In other words, the resurrection is the greatest proof, the greatest evidence of who Jesus is. And uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 4, let's turn there. Made of the seed of David according to the flesh. He was then declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Let's go there. And let's look at this. He, Romans 1 verse 4 tells us 
why Jesus was raised from the dead. There was an open declaration of who Jesus is. Um, now the term declared and was declared, perhaps you have a Bible that in your margin gives an alternative translation to declared. It means to be set forth. To be set forth by the resurrection. Yes, there was a declaration in the resurrection. But Jesus was set forth as being the Son of God. He was declared to be the Son of God in power. Oh, what power it was. And notice how it happened according to the spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit now. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amazing declaration of who this person is. You see, if we're called to put our whole trust in Jesus, we better know who Jesus is. Because if he's not God, then do not put your trust in him at all. Oh, but if he is God, we can put our whole trust in him this morning. Now let's go back to Psalm 2 here. I won't spend as long in these final passages here, and that should be an amen from you, that there will be some end to this in sight. But Psalm 2 verse 8. Psalm 2 verse 8. Now, the Son of God is still speaking in this passage, by the way. It's not quit yet. Um, we've read the part where it says, uh, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. Um, you are my only begotten Son. This day have I begotten you. But now God the Father, in this passage, is still speaking to God the Son. It's important you see it that way. God the Father says to the Son, Ask of me. What is the Son of God doing right now? He ever lives to do what? To make intercession for us? He's not just making intercession for you and me. Guess what? He's making intercession for those who will yet come into the kingdom. Those who are only known by God. I don't know who they are. He knows who they are. Jesus lays claim to a great inheritance. His inheritance is human beings from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And when God the Father is saying to God the Son, ask of me, there's only one intercessor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's it. One intercessor who's been set up in that position. God the Father set him up in that position, and he says to the Son, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Man, if Wyoming isn't the ends of the earth, I don't know where it is. Amen? Jesus has even reached Rock Springs. Hallelujah. I'm glad that Jesus doesn't look at, in, you know, how can you put it, low populated areas and say, oh, we won't bother with that. <laughs> You, you know, it always blesses me, and perhaps it blesses you too, when you drive through these small towns and you see these little churches. And you're like, that's, that's what God wants. He wants churches in these small places because he cares. If there's only 10 in that place, then he will treasure that place. Amen? Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. My friend, this is where we come in. This is where the church comes in. How do you think God has chosen to lay possession of the nations? He's chosen to do it through the preaching of his gospel through the church of God. Amen? This should comfort us because very often we think of preaching the gospel and we're like, is anyone listening? Is anyone receiving? Well, there will be those who will receive and we do not know who they are. We preach the gospel to everybody, but we have no idea who God is going to get a hold of in our preaching and proclamation, right? Some will reject, some will scoff and repent later and receive. You never know, amen? Don't determine the validity of what you're preaching by how it's received or not received. Because we have, we have uh, divine power backing us up here. 
that if we are proclaiming his gospel, we're sent out into the world to share the message of God with others. And Jesus has already asked the Father for people of the nations to be his heritage and the ends of the earth his possession. Let's go to the Great Commission because there's a connection here with the Great Commission. How many of you know the Great Commission has not been rescinded? It's not been lifted from the church. We are still called to do the Great Commission. How many of you know that the Great Commission doesn't just involve preaching the gospel? The Great Commission involves discipling one another. Amen? That's why I think we have two separate passages in the Bible. In Mark 16, the emphasis seems to be on evangelism, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Unlike some student friends I had, that does not include cows. Uh, that's a story for another time. But anyway, every creature is every human being. Praise God. The cows might be more receptive, but it still doesn't count. We're called to preach to every creature. But if you compare both aspects in Mark 16, that's evangelism. But in Matthew 28, we have more discipleship going on, don't we? Let's, let's go there. Matthew 28. And know this. Are you a part of his body this morning? Are you a part of his church? Then this commission was written for you. And it was written for me. And uh, when he says this here, Jesus came and said, to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So all authority has been invested in the Son. And now he invests that authority into his church and through his church. And he authorizes his church to go forth in his name, to make disciples in his name which isn't just a one-time evangelism deal, but it's a repetitious teaching. It's a repetitious practice. It's a repetitious pointing to Christ. It's, it's a sowing of the seed repeatedly, watering that seed repeatedly, and yet we trust that it is God who gives the increase. Amen? When human beings think that they can produce the increase, you might have increase, but it may not be of God if it was you that manufactured that increase. All we can do is keep sowing the seed, watering that seed, and it is God himself who grants the increase. No one can boast if there is an increase because it's God who gives it. Now, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Exousia. It's been delegated. All the authority of the Father is given to the Son, and now the Son gives exousia, authority to the church, delegated authority, and he commissions us and charges us and commands us from that authority to go do something, right? Now, here's a subtle passage here. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There we have the Godhead again, right? Aren't you glad that we have the Godhead with us in this commission? The command, this may surprise you, the command isn't in the go. The command is in the make. It's in the make, disciples. Isn't that what church is? Making disciples? Isn't that our number one call? You see... Sometimes we separate conversion from discipleship, but I think that's a mistake because as soon as you are saved, you are called immediately into being a disciple. That's how Jesus preached the rich young ruler, for example. He didn't say, well, just go home and be nice and enjoy your life and just tack me onto your life. He said, give up everything you have and come follow me. And he wasn't able to do it. He went home sad, right? We can say this. Being a disciple is not an option for the believer. It's a command. 
And we're going to be growing in this till the day we go to be with Jesus. We can never hit that point where we could say, I've arrived. I'm thankful for conversions, but let's not advocate a lie that you can be a convert but not a disciple. Because that's not what God wants. That's not what he's after. He wants discipleship. And that kind of message is a lousy message anyway. This is a life-changing message. This is, this is a wonderful um, message that we've been entrusted with. Let's not water it down. Let's not add to it or take away. But let's preach it in, in its richness and the full potential of what you and I are being called into. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we are identified with the Trinity. We are identified with the Godhead in this discipleship making. Now notice we are called to teaching them. That's a command as well. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, this is the comfort. I am with you always to the end of the age. Isn't that encouraging? We're not in this alone. We're in this with the Lord. The Lord is with us. Now, just in passing here, I have to give the final verse. I know we're breaking into something else here a little bit. But um, verse 9. Verse 9. Here we have an event from our standpoint that's not happened yet. We could say this, that at the penning of Psalm 2, none of it had happened yet. A lot of it now, um, 3,000 years removed from its initial writing, a lot of it has happened for us, right? But when David first penned it, guess what? None of it had taken place yet. We could say that three quarters of this Psalm has happened but this part now, we're getting into the future issue. His second coming. You know why we should bow the knee? And you know why nations should turn to God? Is because he's coming. And he's returning. And he's coming with great power and authority. And his second coming is going to be a scary time for those who are in opposition against him. And this time he's not coming gentle, meek, and humble on a donkey. He's coming on a charger for war. For those who are coming against his people. Those who will be coming against the people of God waiting for his return. Many of the Jewish people at that time. He's coming. And he's going to, well, he says, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. In other words, when he shatters them, they, know, they won't be put back together again. Uh, now, I'll close with this. Uh, Faith Life Study Bible. How many of you have that on your phone? Anybody? Get it. It's free. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they keep adding to it. A lot of great things out there. Um, I recommend it, not just because it's free, although that's a huge bonus. Uh, they keep adding to it. But uh, an iron rod, it symbolizes authority and power. Psalm 110 verse 2, Genesis 49 verse 10. Iron symbolizes strength. Man, when he's coming the second time, he's not coming exactly how he did the first time. Jeremiah 1.18. This verse, and this is why I need to draw this out just in concluding. This verse is alluded to several times in Revelation. You can write this down and look it up later, but all these quotations are given in connection with his second coming, something that's not occurred yet, right? Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Check that out. Check that out. So in closing here, the Bible for us is a book of prophecy. But the Bible for us is almost like going back to the future, pun intended. Uh, <laughs> It's almost like looking at the future like it's in the past. Because only God has that ability to write in that way. And as we read our Bibles, we, we are assured of the future events that will transpire in God's plan. 
And we're a part of this. And so this will anchor our soul in these troubled times. This will anchor our soul in, when we go through personal troubles, personal difficulties that we realize we are involved in something far bigger than us, far bigger than ourselves. And this is where we discover our real identity is what we've been called to and what we've been apprehended for. So be encouraged today and be encouraged to read God's word more and the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus, he will show you things to come. And you know where he showed us things to come? It's right in here, right in this book. The Holy Spirit came and he engineered the writing of the New Testament, the same Holy Spirit that was operative in the prophets. And guess what? That same Holy Spirit is in you. Think about that. And if you're reading the Bible for the lens of the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give some different interpretation than what's already been given. Amen? If you're like me, I'm a bit of a dummy by myself. But with the Holy Spirit, he enlightens. I liken the Holy Spirit to, it's like you've got a cord light and he turns the light on. <laughs> And only he can turn that light on. He, he's the illuminator for the believer. Amen? He was the inspirer of the word. And he directed the writers of scripture. But the same spirit that directed the scriptures to be written. And the same spirit that directed those people to write what they did. Is the same Holy Spirit who illuminates you and I. In connection to what he already inspired. Think about it. We serve a great God. Let's stand and let's pray, shall we? Davy, good to see you, my friend. We've been praying for you. We love you and uh, been praying for your whole family, but it's great to see you. And uh, let's continue to pray for those who are hurting in our congregation. Um, Father, we do thank you this morning for your word. We do thank you, Father, for sending your only son, Oh, Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus to us. And Father, we are grateful for what you've done. And um, we, we pray, open our hearts, open our minds to understand the great things that you have done. Um, break open this marvelous gospel so that, Lord, when we hear crazy, strange stuff, we compare it with your gospel and say, no. I'm sticking with this gospel, this beautiful gospel. Um, Lord, touch hearts today. We continue to uh, lift up Russ and Michelle and, and comfort them and help him. Uh, thank you for all those in this place who are going through trials. Uh, comfort them and help them and strengthen them and let them know that they're not alone in what they're going through. Uh, we thank you today, Lord. Bring all things to our remembrance by that same Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. If anyone needs prayer, we're here to pray for any issue that you need.